Today's problem, my corals are just growing way too darn slow. Well, we've got the top 10 things to get you past this. This is BRS TV Problem Solvers, and if slow growing corals is your problem, this video is the solution, starting with number one. Stop doing anything because stability is the key. A lot of people want to solve their coral growth problems by tossing in more foods, and maybe we feed the corals, and maybe we turn up the lights, and then maybe we add some alkalinity, maybe we add some calcium, you know, and all that really does is start to play with the stability of your tank and might actually drive the problem even further. So if you have a problem with the tank that you know needs solving, go ahead and solve that. But for the most part, it's actually stability that allows the corals to grow. And you won't know it until you experience this, but what happens is the corals grow slow, 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 find stability, then they just take off. Mm. And so they'll sit there as little nubbins, as little teeny, <laughs> uh, tiny frags forever until they find an environment that's stable and allows them to just flourish. And so it is kind of strange that like, how fast they take it off, take off when you just allow them to, but sometimes the answer or the solution is just stop doing anything. All right, number two in relation to that, get your lights, set them up once, set them up to the right par, and then just leave it alone because this is probably the number one thing that people do that screws up their growth, which is just flipping switches and constantly changing their lighting. Yeah, we have recommended goal ranges for PAR, in which case uh, LPS, softy tanks, those primarily your corals in your tank, you should aim for a range of 75 to 150 average throughout the tank. SPS dominated systems, aiming for a little higher part in that 200 to 350 range average throughout the tank. But the big thing is, your eye sucks at determining par, so don't try to do it by eye. You have to have a right tool for this, in which case borrow or buy, you know, buy a par meter from us. Yeah, if you buy a par meter from us, you can actually return it two months from now yeah, uh, and just get a small restocking fee. And we do that just because we want you to be successful and allow you to set it up correctly and intelligently. Uh, and so sometimes it isn't about just leaving it alone. It's about getting it right first and then leaving it alone. Number three, we're hitting on that stability piece again, and this time it's one of the most important components of your water chemistry being alkalinity. And stop asking the question of what range you should be in. Aim for 9 dKH. That's what we recommend. Right in the middle of the road, you're not so close to the low, you're not so close to the high, meaning you got a nice buffer, but it's the stability piece. And one of the best ways that we find stability is by having an easy to use, quick checking mechanism. The Hannah Checker being our favorite, because I can do it in like a minute. But having that constant pulse on dKH means I'm more apt to keep my dKH, my alkalinity stable. This is the reason why. Uh, alkalinity is not just a measurement of how much carbon it's in the water for the calcium carbonate skeleton for the coral, but it's also a measurement of uh, ability of the tank's water to buffer against acidity, which controls pH, and overall chemistry for the tank. So it really has a lot of different effects. It's also relatively little of it in the water, so it can swing pretty fast uh, in an uncontrolled environment. So alkalinity, don't let it sway more than a few tenths of a point in a day. It's certainly not more than an entire point because you'll get way, way better growth if you peg the alkalinity really well. And I actually have a lot of my friends in the industry that tell you that you also get way better coloration out of the corals when you have stable alkalinity as well. Number four, chemistry again and stability again. You can see the theme is going here and it really does matter, but not as much as alkalinity did, mm -hmm. but calcium. 440 and magnesium, 1350. These can sway a little bit more than the alkalinity and not have as big of an impact, but I would shoot for stability the best I can, meaning don't let the calcium go more than about 10 points mm -hmm. and don't let the magnesium go more than 20, and you'll find that stability that fuels your growth. Number five, I'm gonna tell you to fix your pH. You may not think you have a problem, but chances are you are not where you're supposed to be or what's fueling that coral growth. There's multiple ways to get it done. Additives, fuges, skimmers, air exchangers, CO2 scrubbers, but fixing your pH could drive your corals beyond belief. There is a, a reason behind that, and I'll tell you the solutions too. But the reason behind that is 
like carbon dioxide in the air is feeding carbonic acid in the tank and it's lowering the pH and making the tank more acidic. In that environment, the coral just grows slower. And so there is what we would call the survival zone, yeah. meaning like things aren't going to necessarily die between 7.8 and 8.3. If you're in there, things may not kick the bucket and they will survive, but they're not going to fuel maximized growth. The closer you get to 8.3, the faster these corals will grow. They'll be able to build denser skeletons and be healthier closer to 8.3 because the water isn't as acidic. And so these are the ways to shoot for that 8.3 mm. where things are really going to take off. By the, way, by the way, when I say take off, we did the BRS TV investigates here where they grow 50% faster when you control the pH, right? This is the type of thing that's also found in the ocean by marine biologists as well. So all of these thing, things fit together. 50% factor, exponential as well, meaning 50 on 50 on 50, meaning I might be able to grow out my tank maybe five times as fast. I'll get it done in just a couple of years where it might take somebody else many, many years. Mm. So in this case, the four ways that I would do this, it's all about controlling the amount of carbon dioxide in your, in your room. We're all breathing, our pets are breathing. It's a lot of stuff that's going into the tank and creating that carbonic acid. Number one way? Number one way is additives that naturally, or that raise the pH. So we're talking caulk washers that have a pH boosting effect, a soda ash and using it to be, uh, that has a pH boosting effect. There's other additives out there that also do the same thing, but you're looking for some of those, uh, those ones that boost pH, you can actually dose it and see your pH on, uh, if you have a monitor, go up. So what we're talking about here is not like pH buffer deluxe and right. super buffers. What we're talking about is normal two-part additives, normal ways to raise your calcium alkalinity that have a side benefit of raising the pH. One of the best ones at that is uh, both uh, Kelkwasser as well as uh, Triton has mm. uh, the highest pH uh, boost of any of the uh, commercial two-part additives that we've seen. So consider one of those, but another way is actually to soak up the carbon dioxide out of the tank or carbonic acid, and that's using a fuge or a scrubber. Yeah, so the algae of the catomorpha is typically what you have in your fuge, the most popular, but it's a plant, and we all know from high school science that plants soak up CO2 and uh, get rid of it. It's doing that in your tank, being that you'll have a pH boosting benefit. Another one is to control how much carbon dioxide is added to the tank via your skimmer. Mm. You can run it line outside, uh, which is sucks up fresh air from outside rather than it's getting trapped inside your house with all of our breathers. <laughs> uh, you can also run it through a CO2 scrubber and the scrubber will just scrub off all of the CO2 going to the tank. This one can as the way to re really peg it at 8.3. Mm. You can put a little solenoid on your skimmer valve there and it will just turn on and off as needed and you can have 8.3 24-7. But there's one way actually that many people don't think about is how do I control in the house so it doesn't get into the tank? Yeah, so you can uh, remove a lot of that heavy excess CO2 from all of us breathing, especially in the colder months when all the windows are closed. Get yourself like an air exchanger. I put an air exchanger on your house where it actually is bringing that balance of CO2 out and ox fresh oxygenated uh, air back in. Yeah, and like you might actually go look, you might have an air exchanger and it's set to the lowest setting. You can actually crank it up and make sure that you're getting fresh air in and getting all of that excess CO2 out. So there's a reason that we spent a good chunk of time on pH here because of all the things that you heard today, pH might be the one that grows the corals faster than anything else that we've said. All right, number six, prey and dissolve foods. The corals absolutely benefit from the ability to replicate what they do in nature, which is capture prey. They get all kinds of microfauna and bacteria from all the blooms that happen in the ocean, particularly at night when the polyps come out and capture them. However, in the reef tank, that isn't always as available, and we gotta think about how do we replace it. Yeah, so there's a lot of coral foods out there that would be considered prey. I'm thinking of the, the particulate foods, so your reef chilies, your reef roys, these types of things that are floating around in the tank when you uh, feed it to your tank, and the coral polyps actually grab onto them, capture them. Dissolved foods is, think of the liquid type stuff. You got coral aminos, there's all kinds of amino acids. One of my favorite uh, being like the Red Sea AB+. This thing, uh, you can actually see it in the tank. It turns neon vibrant green, and then you can see it surrounding all of your corals. This is like a dissolved food that they just can osmotically um, you know, soak up. Yeah, so amino acids being the building blocks of protein. The tissue on the coral 
protein based. So when you have those building blocks of protein, some of which that are very difficult to synthesize in the amount that they need just from photosynthesis, when you add those things via prey, it can grow its tissue much faster. Mm. And I will say when you add a little drops of your coral amino, you might say, well, I don't know, what is that doing? But like you said, when you put that like AB plus in there from Red Z, you can see it because it's actually colored, you know, coating the entire tank and you can visualize how it's probably mm. absorbing this thing. And again, in Beers TV Investigates, we found that these corals grow way, way, way faster. You saw a bunch of corals that were thin and losing tissue. And actually, when you put that uh, uh, coral amino in there and the source of those free form amino acids, all of a sudden the tissue comes back and it just takes off. All of this actually stemming from our conversations with Worldwide Corals where they do just that. Mm -hmm. They feed the aminos to get them to grow faster and they actually nurture many of the wounded corals back with the ability for the coral to use those proteins or amino acids to build its own protein tissue. Number seven, we're talking about nutrients next, nitrates, phosphates, and avoiding zero, zero. That means un undetectable levels of nitrates, undetectable uh, levels of phosphates. The thought process be behind this, you know, historically has been, I'm going to starve out nuisance algae, hair algae, and these types of things by just knocking out nitrates and phosphates that fuel the algae. But what we forget is that algae also lives in the coral, in the zooxanthellae, and you're starving them out as well. Yeah, so every living organism needs a source of phosphorus and nitrogen to, uh, nitrogen to build its DNA. And one of the problems uh, of the past was uh, fighting algae. That isn't as big of a problem today. There's so many tools for that and our knowledge base on it is so much bigger. It just isn't that big of an issue. Now, instead of solving that thing with a hammer of zero nitrate and zero phosphate, solving that, uh, we're now trying to solve coral growth and getting the best absolute health for the organism and it isn't starve it off. Now, there is one thing to think about here. There's inorganic and organic nitrogen and phosphorus. Inorganic meaning I'm measuring nitrate and phosphate levels in the tank, it's zero, zero, and it might seem like there's none. There's also organic. Organic is material, like uh, actual foods, like, if I put a bunch of reef chili into the tank or a bunch of amino acids into the tank, uh, I might actually find that there's enough nitrogen and phosphorus sources in the foods that I'm adding to the tank that the coral's capturing for its metabolic processes, even though there's zero, zero measured in the uh, aquarium. And I say that that's important because that's the way it is in the ocean. Mm. In the ocean, phosphorus and nitrate, basically undetectable. Like our test kits could not get that low in most cases to, add, to measure it accurately in the ocean. But there's tons of prey. That prey is a primary source of nitrogen and phosphorus for many of the corals in the ocean. Number eight, go look at your tank, identify where the dead spots are in the tank, and you'll probably also identify that is where the corals are growing the slowest as well. Yeah, so the corals need the flow not only to, you know, bring those foods and preys and dissolve, uh, dissolve foods to them, they also need the flow to expel all of the waste byproduct from them growing, and when they don't have a way to get rid of the waste, they don't grow. Almost everything that the coral needs or needs to get rid of is because flow is uh, hitting the <laughs> coral in the right way. So look at all the spots in your tank. And if you can literally see where water slows down because you just have two pumps on the side and then there's a big cavern in the middle where there's no flow, look at the corals. If the corals are flourishing and you're happy with the growth, they'll leave it alone. But the reason you're watching this video is probably <laughs> because they're not, and if they're not, get more flow, which will get more nutrients, it'll get more uh, protein sources of uh, amino acids and prey. It'll also uh, get more elements to it. It'll make it easier for the coral to absorb all of the uh, carbonate and calcium, magnesium and the trace elements, all of the things it needs and then all the things it needs to get rid of as well. So flow, one of the biggest keys to growth in here. Number nine, how much would you grow if you were irritated? Well, this could happen in your tank as well. Irritants in the water, building up in the water. If your tank looks awesome after a water change and everything looks happy and you know, they have their polyps and extended uh, tentacles out, that could be a sign that something's in your tank uh, that is irritating them, in which case more water changes or run something like carbon that can help pull those out so that way they're not sucking in on themselves and just hiding from, from being irritated all the time. 
if you're looking at in the tank and all the polyps are sucked in yeah. and everything, the tissue looks thin and it just looks all detracted, there's a good chance that something in that water isn't so toxic that it's going to kill them, but it is toxic enough to irritate them and prevent them from growing. So like Randy said, do a water change, change out the carbon. If things look better, it's almost certainly because <laughs> something was in the water that was pissing it off. Don't wow. stop there. Go do a couple more water changes and make sure you get all of it out. Number 10, ICP for the unexplainable. Mm -hmm. You've gone through all of the other things out there and still the corals won't grow fast. I'm leaving it alone. The par is right. The nutrients are right. I got everything else. It's just it wasn't going the right direction. Maybe there's something here that you just don't know about. Yeah, there's stories all over the forums, the, the groups, you know, stuff that we've actually seen here in house where there's just this unexplained thing in the water. Nothing the test kits are doing, everything is right, but you send in an ICP test and, huh, there's elevated levels of copper, lithium, you know, these weird things that you have to track down to how does it get in there in the first place, but it's that ICP test, the things that we can't test for with our 10 to $15 test kits, uh, just to get a better picture into what's going on in the tank. And maybe you only have to send one of these off once a year. So a couple of things that come to mind here is uh, my kid threw a couple of pennies in the tank. Uh, another one is a, a, I know a gentleman that had uh, uh, just a slow drip, not very often, but every once in a while, right off the copper pipes, drip right into mm -hmm. the sump. Mm -hmm. Had to find the source of copper to do this. So when it's irritated uh, or something related to uh, like a toxin in the water, that isn't killing everything, but it's definitely pushing things back. ICP is definitely the final step to say, what the hell is going on here and how do I solve it? All right, coral growth, problem solved. What's next? What's next is that mastering your pH and understanding why it is so important. We have the master your pH video right over here. And if you want one of the, the biggest additive systems to actually solve it, it doesn't just solve it chemically, but in two ways, you can solve pH with the Triton method. Learn about it right here.